Okay, it seems we can start and I would like to welcome you to the 12th um, webinar by the Bioencapsulation Research Group. Today with the topic of coated pellets and micro pellets, modern concepts, formation and case studies. Um, just check that I can switch my screen here. Um, please be aware that during the webinar, we will not answer the questions, but you can put them in the Q&A window session and use the chat for technical problems if you have any. Um, the podcast will also be available on uh, bioencapsulation.net. Um, this webinar is co-organized or co conjointly organized by the Bioencapsulation Encapsulation Research Group Association and NCAP for Health. So um, please also, of course, have a look at, at both um, of the organizations mentioned here. Um, they will be certainly happy to get your interest. And uh, now it's a big, big pleasure um, to welcome Norbert Pölling, my colleague um, from Black Pharmaceutical Services, in my opinion, the absolute expert on anything which has to do with pellet production using fluid bed um, technology. I know Norbert now <clears throat> officially together at GLAD since over 10 years. Before that, I used to um, meet him many occasions and um, I personally call him the Pope of pellets, but um, this he has to prove now by himself. And uh, with further ado, I would like to leave, the, leave you the floor and um, we'll enjoy the next um, hour or so to listen to you again. Thanks a lot, Norbert, to take over. Thank you, Philip. So, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our today's webinar. I'm happy. Um, to have the chance uh, to talk to you about our today's topic. And thank you, Philip, for the warm introduction, old friend. <laughs> so our today's topic is about uh, coated pellets and micro pellets, and we will cover a modern concept. We will talk about the formation of such pellets, and we will show you a few case studies, uh, which is important. Uh, to understand uh, what's going on there. Uh, I would like to uh, start uh, with a few common topics uh, covering uh, the pellets. Uh, what we are talking about, pellets is a plurality of subunits different from tablets. And if you look at a controlled release tablets and uh, controlled pellets or micro pellets, you immediately see what's meant uh, in a controlled release tablet, all the API is contained in one form, whereas with the pellets, it's distributed on multiple small discrete units. So it's clear that dose dumping, the risk of a certain dose dumping in case of biting the medication into pieces uh, is much more pronounced when we have to do with a big tablet containing all the drug. Uh, if we bite on it, then we no longer will uh, have to expect the controlled release and uh, the blood levels in a therapeutic, therapeutic window, but we will have an immediate release, an unintended immediate release and the dose dumping effect and we will leave uh, the therapeutic range, go into the toxic one, and this is not good. You see here the example with met metoprolol pellets versus a controlled release tablet. So uh, to say it again, much higher risk uh, with tablets uh, in terms of unintended dose dumping. A second aspect we have to uh, consider when we talk about uh, these multiple small discrete units is we have a higher degree of safety and a higher degree of efficacy. So the food effect, 
the remaining time uh, for the drug product in the stomach uh, is much less variable uh, in the case of multiple particulates than it would be if we have only one single big unit. And the same is true for the systemic absorption. So we have a much reduced variability uh, in bio uh, availability in biological effects in systemic absorption. And what we can also see on the picture is we have a minimized risk of uh, local high local drug concentrations in the GI tract. You can imagine if we have a, a big dose unit, a big tablet, which is sticking to the walls of the stomach, to a particular a part of the stomach, uh, it can hurt the stomach there. Um, if we would distribute this dose into small particles, they would cover the whole area of the stomach and the risk of uh, local side effects in the, in the stomach is also much reduced. What else do we have to expect? Can we expect with multiparticulates? It's a high dose flexibility. What we see here is uh, different capsules and they are filled with different doses of one type of pellets uh, showing us different dosage strengths filled into capsules uh, starting with one particular pellet type. This here is an example uh, where we have one pellet type for children and for adults. And you can also imagine that in a clinical development, uh, if we talk about those titration, those finding studies, studies uh, it's quite comfortable to have pellets to fill them into different uh, in different quantities into capsule and with one pellet formulation we can cover a big part of a dose titration study. If we compare this with tablets, if, if we want to have different doses, increasing doses in a tablet, we could produce different kind of granules with a different drug load. Then we have, like in this case, four tablet strengths, all with the same tablet size. Yeah, it's much more complicated than with the pellets. And if we want to, um, to produce only one type of granules, we would have to prepare different dosage strengths by increasing the tablet size. Also, this is much more complicated than the concept with the multiparticulates taking one pellet type, fill different quantities in a capsule, done. Another aspect is the particle size. So uh, what we see here is the size of tablets, capsules, uh, very big ones. This may be true for high dose drugs, such as antibiotics, for instance, 10 millimeter tablets, this is quite usual, but in the multi-particulates we have we can see uh, that we are more in the range of one millimeter down to 0 0.5, 0 0.2 millimeters. We have tiny particles, which are certainly much more easy to swallow if we would apply them as such compared with tablets or capsules. The same is true for mini tablets. They are bigger than pellets. Uh, today, we are talking about pellets only. The particle size, uh, this is important for uh, swallowing, and swallowing is an age-dependent capability. So uh, we could say age matters. Uh, we look at very young people, children, the youngest one, premature, newborns, babies, children, they are in a position to swallow small particles such as pellets, micro pellets, also mini tablets. The same is true for uh, the geriatric population, uh, which is uh, facing 
swallowing capabilities which are no longer as good as the ones for uh, the adult population and also for this group, the multiparticulates are much more comfortable to apply and to swallow. Only the, the adults uh, in the best age, the best ages, the adolescents, they are able to swallow uh, big monolithic forms like tablets and capsules. So we have big advantages for the young population and for the elderly. Another aspect uh, we can cover very well uh, with our pellets concept is the truck release. We can, so to say, tailor truck release profiles uh, in any way we want to do that. We could prepare immediately, immediate release uh, going along with taste masking, for instance. We can go for controlled or modified release, different. Uh, kinetics of drug release. Uh, we could make drug targeting to release the drug only in the colon and not before. And we can also apply pH dependent release concept uh, as we do it very often with enteric coating where in the, in the stomach at acidic pH, we have no drug release, almost no drug release and afterwards mimicking uh, the small intestine, uh, we have a neutral pH and their drug release takes place quite fast. What we can also do is we can avoid a very often drug dosing in one day uh, as we would have to do it with an immediate drug release product, uh, which may have to be given five times per day, just as an example. With a modified release product, such as multiparticulates, we could reduce the application frequency to one to two times per day, stay um, more clearly in the therapeutic range where the level of uh, side effects may be quite reduced compared to the peaks we have to face with immediate release products. So consistent blood levels when we have a long-term therapy uh, goes along with optimized safety, with optimized efficacy and an improved patient compliance. I would like to show you here uh, one example, a therapy uh, with an immediate release hydrocortisone product. Hydrocortisone uh, must be uh, regularly applied um, by uh, persons whose bodies does not produce cortisone by itself. So they must take cortisone medication in order to survive. And if they would take immediate release products three times per day, they have to face peaks and troughs, which are different from the natural blood levels as we see it here in the yellow curve. The natural circadian cortisone blood levels, this is something we should try to go for. And for this purpose, um, actually a product is uh, in development and in the registration phase, uh, it's called Gronocort. And this one is designed to mimic the physiological cortisol levels, and we see that this works much better with this product than we saw it before with the immediate release formulation. The product itself, the, the chronocort pellets, including the hydrocortisone providing modified release, uh, they could be, they are set up like this. We have inert starter beads, could be sugar or cellulose. We apply the hydrocortisone drug layer and on top we apply a modified release coat which is controlling the release of the drug. And uh, we could expect uh, in vitro drug release like we see it here. We have very low drug release, uh, kind of pulsatile release for a while and uh, after the lag phase, we have the release 
uh, of the hydrocortisone. So for the treatment of uh, uh, disease, which goes along with no production of cortisone by the body of the patient, we would now have two types of medication. The one for the young people from the day of birth with an immediate release hydrocortisone. This is a product called Alkindi, which is currently in the market in a number of countries. And uh, the new one, which is the one adding uh, the, the added to the immediate release product. This is the chronocord. And this one people would take, yeah, so to say, every day of their lifetime, uh, providing them a quite convenient hydrocortisone substitution. Drug targeting, that means uh, we prepare pellets, micro pellets in order to treat diseases uh, at particular parts of the body, for instance, in the colon, as we see it here, uh, I would like to mention Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, the irritable bowel syndrome, and drug compounds, which are uh, very often applied for this uh, diseases is mesalazin, sulfur salazine, uh, corticoid called badesonin. For the colon drug targeting, uh, we do not need a systemic absorption. We just have to take good care that uh, our pellets reach uh, the colon undamaged and in the colon, they would release the medication uh, driven by a particular uh, circumstances in the colon like uh, bacteria, metabolic enzymes and the like. And then we have a local treatment of the disease in the colon. With uh, multiparticulates, we can prepare a number of different drug products. The most simple one is capsules, just fill them into capsules. Here, particle size is not as important as if we would try to prepare a liquid, which is then applied to the patient or for children if we would put it to apple juice, for instance, and children would then take the medication together with apple juice. So here we try to avoid the gritty mouth feeling, which could lead to biting on the, on the medication. And therefore we have to take good care that we reach tiny particle size, which is usually below the limit of 500 micrometers. We could also put, um, these pellets through a nasogastric tube, for instance, if people are not in a position to swallow due to their uh, disease, uh, the pellets can be driven through the, through the nasogastric tube and uh, applied uh, as an oral medication. High potent drug products uh, means uh, we have to take good care on work safety. And I will later on show you a case study uh, how uh, multi-particulates, how pellets are feasible for this. Uh, yeah, special applications for the quite highly effective, uh, sometimes highly toxic compounds. And we will see uh, that Pellet manufacturing is much more simpler than tablet manufacturing sometimes. And the look into the future, individual precision polymedicine, we see here a scenario which is not uncommon. Some uh, elderly, some sick people have to take a lot of tablets of pills every day, in the morning, at noon, in the evening. And uh, this is sometimes not so easy to handle, not to mix it, mix it up, um, not to change uh, medication. And we could uh, think about uh, making it more comfortable and more simple for uh, such people uh, with benefit for efficacy, safety and compliance again. So the, the future could be that we uh, look at every single patient. We are working more patient oriented. We try to provide more convenient 
uh, medicine. And by this, uh, by this aspect, we try to ease to the self-management of the patients and reduce medication errors. And that could look like this. Uh, we have uh, different uh, APIs for the treatment of different indications. We prepare our multiparticulates and by the means of a automatism of a robot or whatsoever, they are counted into small sachets for the morning, for the noon and for the evening. And people then have their medication all in one uh, which they can more easily uh, intake. And by this uh, procedure, we would have a more or less individualized medicine for our patients. This is something for the future, which has already begun. So let's come uh, to our second part and look more to the technologies. And uh, in order to illustrate the technologies, we have a number of case studies. Our basic micro pellet or pellet composition is well known. This is the final pellet. Uh, we have a core with the drug inside and the coating on top. So pellet is consisting of a core, including the API and the functional coating or a number of functional coatings. And here is the overview um, on uh, the technologies for the pelletization step and for the coating step. We see uh, without going into details, we have quite a number of different technologies for the core pellet manufacturing whereas we would focus on one technology when it comes to coating of our core pellets. And in the next minute, we would like uh, to present to you these different technologies and illustrate them. So core pellets or micro pellets, the first technology which is quite well introduced is the drug layering technology. And one of those uh, is the fluidized bed Worcester or bottom spray technology, which uh, can be characterized as a process starting with starter beads, smaller or larger starter beads. And on top of the starter beads, a drug layer is applied by means of a fluidized bed technology, uh, which is working with the bottom spray principle, which is also called the Worcester principle. This one is characterized by a very controlled airflow and by a very controlled particle flow. Every time every single particle passes the spray nozzle, he gets a number of droplets on top and uh, stepwise, uh, we can apply the drug layer. Uh, for this purpose, starter beads uh, of 100 micrometers, this would be the smallest one or larger ones can be used. The technology works very well with the tiny starter beads and working very well means we have no losses. We can apply all the drug layer uh, on top of the starter beads. And the other thing is we can do that without agglomeration of the particles. You can imagine the smaller the particles are, the higher is the risk of an unintended uh, agglomeration. And with this technology, we can avoid this agglomeration almost completely. The API, uh, must be given into a liquid and uh, from the liquid uh, it's sprayed into the process and it's clear if we work with a liquid the API must be chemically stable uh, in the drug layering liquid. This technology uh, is applied for a very wide range of API content in our 
core pellets uh, for the very low dosed one, it can be less than 0.1%. And uh, at the higher end, we can achieve a truck concentration in these core pellets of up to 80%. The size, uh, if we have not too high uh, dosed APIs, we would end up with a particle size of 200 micrometers when we had started with 100 micrometers. So this technology uh, is the preferred technology worldwide applied for drug layering when we have chemically stable APIs. Yeah. If we have that, this should be absolutely the first choice. Here we see again how it works. Uh, we have the starter beads, the yellow ones, and we have the droplets containing the API and most of the time a binder coming out of the spray guns. Uh, the droplets, they find the starter beads, they solidify on the surface of the starter beads. And after a while, uh, the truck layer is formed, depending how much and how long we spray, it's a thin one or it's a thick one. Where's the bottom spray technology for this application? The absolute standard. Here we have a case study. We, uh, again, our hydrocortisone, pellets, brand Alkindi. Uh, we start with cellulose beads and from a liquid, we apply the truck layer using the fluid bed with the technology. After this process, we have the drug layered beads. A second example, and here we do not use uh, cellulose or sugar beads as a uh, starting material, but we, we use an acid, an acidic bead, a tartaric acid bead. We use the same technology, the bottom spray was the technology, and we use the tartaric acid bead in order to make a water insoluble uh, API, a basic API, better soluble, not only in the lab, but also to make it better soluble uh, in the stomach and intestine and make it better bioavailable. So in this case, we have a drug layering liquid uh, with the API, with a binder, uh, in our case study here, we have an organic solvent uh, as um, the solvent and uh, the API is suspended in the truck layering liquid. It must not be dissolved. Yeah, most of the time, the API is just suspended and this is guaranteeing a quite fast process. So in the end, we have this product. We have the tartaric acid beads. In our case, they have a size of about 800 to 1000 micrometers. They are seal coated with a water soluble coat just to separate the acid from the active compound. If they would be in close contact to each other, that would not be good because they are chemically not uh, compatible. With the seal coat, we can separate them from each other and they are chemically stable. Here we see the process. We have the tartaric acid pellets. They are already seal coated here. We have a microfine uh, active compound, which is suspended in an organic solvent. And using the Worcester technology, we apply this liquid on top of the tartaric acid beads. This is the drug layered pellets we achieve in the end. Just to show you uh, the efficiency of such a process, a uh, case study from a commercial production. This is a quite big product uh, in the international market and it's produced using a CLUT fluid bed Worcester equipment, it's a so-called 46 inch Worcester. This is the biggest one. Uh, it works with six spray nozzles, six bottom spray nozzles. We have 275 kilograms of starter beads. 
uh, in the end, we have 600 kilos of drug layered beads and they have a drug load of 40% in the end. We have to process 1,300 kilograms of drug layering liquid. This is quite a lot. It's a big container. But as we work with a spray rate of seven kilograms per minute, this total process is not taking longer than three hours. So this is really, really fast. Uh, in the commercial process, they have always a yield higher than 98% and they have no agglomerates. So it's a real robust commercial process. This was our first drug layering uh, technology. Let's look at the second one, which is dry powder layering technology. So no longer uh, we put uh, the API into a liquid, but we process it as a powder. Here you see the installation. This is again our fluid bed unit. We have a so-called rotor configuration installed and the particles, they are moved um, not only by air, but also uh, by a rotating disc and uh, it ends up in kind of a spiral like movement of our starter beads. And here the dry powders, they are fed uh, into, into the process by means of a powder feed nozzle together with a liquid nozzle. The liquid is binding the crystals um, on top of our starter beads. So this is again a process, a batch process. And again, we could use tiny starter pellets uh, sized uh, 100 micrometers uh, to end up then uh, with the drug layered beads. Uh, we would recommend this technology for an API content of in between 10 to 80%. And it's very uh, helpful in particular for APIs which are moisture sensitive. So if you could not put your moisture sensitive API into water or into an organic sol solvent for a few hours, then this would be a good alternative. We process the API as a powder. We add just a little bit of binder liquid which does not wet uh, the sensitive API too much, and we have a stable product in the end. Here again, we see how it works. We have the starter beads, we have the powder particles, and we have the droplets of a binder liquid. The <clears throat> API uh, powders, they are fed into the process together with the liquid droplets, the liquid droplets wet, uh, the API particles and the wetted, I, wetted API particles, they form a drug layer on top of our starter beads, which become thicker and thicker throughout the process. This is the principle. A case study from 2014. Here, an international company uh, located in Germany, they wanted to install a new process uh, for producing uh, pellets out of the Prasol proton pump inhibitor family. Um, they have uh, starter beads made of sugar, one, 600 to 1000 micrometers. They have the API powder blend, including a binder. API is, uh, the starter beads is 25% the powder is 75%. And this huge powder mass must be layered on top of the starter beads. So in the end, we have four times uh, the initial weight. Uh, commercial batch size is about 100 kilograms and uh, the process takes one hour. And this is almost unbelievable fast. Uh, to have four times the initial weight uh, in the end within one hour. So this would definitely not possible uh, with the truck layering technology out of a liquid. 
Here we see the whole process. We have the starter beads. We have the powders for the drug layering. We apply the dry powder in our dry powder layering process. And to stabilize the drug layer, which can be uh, harmed by uh, too long a movement uh, in this rotor. And uh, also in the initial phase of the coating, we would better add a seal coat, which is water soluble, just to physically stabilize it. And then we would transfer the drug layered and stabilized beads into the Worcester technology again and apply the functional coatings. These are our two technologies for drug layering, the Worcester processing of a liquid and the dry powder layering. Now we come to the matrix pellets. Matrix pellets, they do not use starter beads, but we have a homogeneous matrix out of the API and the excipients. And the first process I would like to show you is a batch process we would call uh, CPS, controlled perfect spheres, and a former uh, technology or the rotor, which you may also know. What we have here is, you see here uh, our matrix pellets. They can be tiny. So we are in a position to produce micro pellets. They can be larger. They can have a lower or higher truck load. Uh, we have the two technologies, the rotor and this more modern one, the CPS technology. And what we do is we have the API and we have a most important excipients. This is microcrystalline cellulose powder. We put them, for instance, into our CPS unit and we start the process just adding a liquid and agglomerating and spheronizing the powders. We could here expect an API content of somewhere in between 0.5 to 70%. And the size of micro pellets of the small ones could be somewhere in between 150 to 400 micrometers. So very, very small pellets. Uh, this is sometimes a bit delicate because it depends, the success of the process uh, depends on the behavior of the drug compound. What we would like to have is uh, we have our powder particles, cellulose and API, we have a liquid. We first of all make a, a, a irregular granule and by spheronization, we get a more and more round particle in the end. And what we would like to have is singular particles. Sometimes it's, now oh, we come to it later. Here we see again uh, the installation. We have uh, two options. Uh, this is our fluid bed and we could mount a nozzle uh, spraying from the top. That would be a so-called centrifugal atomizing nozzle, which is running at a very high speed, 5,000 to 10,000 rounds per minute. And uh, by this speed, a liquid is atomized into fine droplets. Or we have a standard nozzle, which is mounted tangentially, as we have it in our classical rotor. It's a classical two component or binary nozzle. Uh, processing the liquid uh, with atomizing air. And uh, for the future, this will be our standard because it's much more simpler to handle than the centrifugal nozzle. A product uh, which uh, GLUT uh, in its site in Dresden in Eastern Germany is producing are microcrystalline cellulose starter beads. The brand of those is uh, Cellets, and we have different qualities of the Cellets referring to the particle size. The smallest have a size of in between 100 to 200 micrometers, 
and the biggest ones are in between 1000 to 1400 micrometers. They have an ideal look. Yeah, and that's why processing of pure cellulose powder, this is the ideal situation for this process. The more we dilute the cellulose powder with an API, uh, the more complicated it sometimes gets. We see here a few products. Uh, on the left hand, we have propranolol core pellets with 60% of API inside. They look very good. We have single uh, pellets. Uh, we have a very smooth surface and uh, propranolol hydrochloride. This is a, a very good natured API, easy to process uh, with the CPS technology. Omibrazol, here we have uh, another uh, formulation, core pellets with 20% of API consisting of omeprazole, cellulose, and magnesium stearate as an anti-tacking. Yeah, it works. We again have very spherical particles, uh, singular particles, yeah, also a robust process. In the middle, we see something which we do not like so much. We see isomeprazole core pellets. And here, obviously, uh, the formulation, the composition is not as ideal. Here, um, polyethylene glycol 4000 was used as an anti-tacking. And uh, this led to the situation that we could not produce singular particles but we had pellets which immediately agglomerated to larger agglomerates. And this is something uh, we do not like. So uh, the process is okay and good as long as we have the right composition. Uh, it's important that we have a technology which shows us when we reach the target size uh, of our particles. And one technology, um, it's an optical technology called ICON. It's uh, sold by an Irish company called Innofarma Technology. And we could use it offline, uh, just uh, placing it beneath our uh, process machine, take a sample and measure the particles and look at them. Here we see a photograph of the particles and we see the particle size distribution. And the same we could, the same equipment we could use online, just placing it in front of a window, letting it look into the process and connect it uh, with the control system uh, of our unit. Um, the goal must be that we have an automized process in the end that our a PAT system gives a feedback to the control system, uh, which is then reacting with the process parameters. Let's summarize uh, the process options for this matrix pelletization with the CPS. The singlest approach would be we put all the powders into the machine. We just add a little bit of liquid. We pelletize and spheronize. Uh, uh, in two steps in the same equipment and then uh, transfer into a fluid bed fryer. Uh, some people uh, first put uh, the powders into a high shear granulator, into a high shear mixer for wetting and then transfer it into the CPS uh, fluid bed unit where they continue with the agglomeration, pelletization, and spheronization before they then go over into the fluid bed dryer. So it's a, it's a batch process and the smallest particles we can get is something in between 100 to 500 micrometers. This is a batch process. We have also continuous processes for preparing matrix pellets. And the very well known is extrusion and spheronization. Everybody knows it's uh, in use for decades. 
and even more in the food industry or feed industry than in the pharmaceutical industry. The particles, the pellets we can expect, they are not as ideally spherical and smooth as the ones we get from other technologies like the CPS. So what we do here is we have a continuous process. We have a quite similar composition as uh, I presented to you for this CPS batch process. So we have the API, we have microcrystalline cellulose powder, and the API again is processed as a powder. Again, we have drug load uh, in the final pellets, uh, maybe lower than 0.1%, up to 60%. The first step is the extrusion. Uh, we have spaghetti-like uh, formations coming out of the extruder. Uh, the spaghettis, they break into smaller units and they are then spheronized in, in the spheronizer. It's important to know that micro pellets, uh, as we can get them uh, with the other technologies, they are not possible with an extruder. Yeah? And that depends on the size of the holes through which we have to push the vetted moss. Not possible for the micro pellets. We see here again our well already well-known propranolol matrix pellets. These are the ones we prepared with the CPS technology in the batch process, uh, same composition was uh, applied to extrusion and spheronization. And we see a clear difference, uh, the sphericity, uh, the size distribution, the surface, and also the density of these pellets is different to the ones we have with the CPS process. So if we could select, uh, then we would say CPS pellets look better and they are more ideal for coating applications due to their surface characteristics, particle size distribution. Extrusion is a quite uh, yeah, complicated technical procedure. We first have to wet, then we have to extrude, then we have to spheronize and we have to dry. So we have a number of uh, technical installations in the end, uh, we have a continuous process and we cannot get micro pellets. Another continuous process application is mentioned here. And these are two GLUT technologies which are in the pharmaceutical market for, yeah, let's say for decades already not used too much so far, but more and more interest uh, comes uh, for these technologies. They are called MicroPix or ProCell technology. What we get are, again, matrix core pellets. We usually use these technologies in order to get very small and very high drug loaded particles. So the ones we cannot easily get with drug layering or with the CPS, we would, we would uh, manufacture with these continuous technologies. The one is a fluid bed uh, spray agglomeration process, the MicroPix. We have a rectangular shaped uh, processing chamber. Um, we have bottom spray nozzles and we have in this case a zigzag. A discharge unit which is controlling the particle size by sifting air. And on the right side, we have the so called pro cell technology. You see, it looks completely different from the installation from the air uh, distribution into the processing chamber. It's a so called spouted bed technology. Both are continuous processes. Both are providing matrix pellets, so we need no starters. And both are processing the API, most of the time, including a binder, 
from a liquid. This liquid uh, is not too often a solution. Uh, it's most of the time a suspension of the API in a binder liquid, but it also can be an emulsion or it can be a melt. And with this technology, we can achieve API concentrations of up to 100%. You can imagine if you have a drug compound, which is, uh, which could be soluble in water and provide some stickiness. Uh, we would need no binder. We would just uh, process uh, the solution of the API, the sticky solution of the API. And by this means we could get 100% drug load in matrix pellets. Or if we would melt an API having a low melting point, such as ibuprofen, for instance, we do not need any excipient for the pelletization. We would just uh, proceed with the melt and solidify it in the technology. Also here we can get micro pellets having a size of 150 micrometers to 400 micrometers. This is a realistic range we could prove with a number of projects. And this technology we would not use because it's continuous. This is not the main reason. We would use it because it's a unique technology to provide high truck loaded, tiny micro pellets, high loaded micro pellets. This uh, particular quality can only be achieved when we apply these technologies. Now here we see an example, it's claritromycin micro pellets manufactured with this micropix technology. We have here core micro pellets, matrix pellets with a size of 200 to 400 micrometers. We see here the particle size distribution. You see how they look, they look beautiful and they are an ideal substrate for coating applications as we see them here. This is a taste masking on top of micro pellets. The process is such that we start with nothing. We just have a liquid with our API and binder in, if we talk of a suspension. We spray the suspension into the processing chamber in the first uh, approach, we have some spray drying. We produce tiny particles and these particles, they are growing and growing like uh, onions. And in the end, we have exactly the particle size we want. Many people ask us, uh, is this uh, something like spray drying? Um, we see here spray drying on the, on the left hand and spray drying is continuous, but it's different. Spray drying means we have a liquid which we spray into the, into the production chamber with the help of a nozzle. We get tiny particles sized uh, smaller than 20 micrometers. Usually they are very spherical, often they are hollow and they leave the processing chamber uh, during the spray drying process within seconds. Yeah, that's why, why they are so small. With the Micropix or the ProCell, we have uh, partly spray drying, but this is combined with truck layering in the same process. And that's why we get particles which are larger in size 100 micrometers, two, three, 400 micrometers. They are very dense, they are spherical, and they are an ideal substrate for coating applications. This is the difference between spray drying and uh, spray agglomeration. Uh, I showed you before that we can uh, truck layer in order to get pellets in our Worcester technology. And I also told you that 80% uh, drug load is possible. Uh, sometimes even 90% drug load is possible. If we have 
only API binder and a tiny quantity of starters. But then a process would look like this. We, we need to split the batch uh, one, two times, uh, start the process from the beginning because it's not possible uh, to start with one kilo and end up with 100 kilos of drug layered beads from one drug layering process. This is technically not possible. If we compare this uh, possible but quite complicated and demanding situation with a continuous process, uh, we see continuous process looks quite simple. We have our liquid, we spray uh, in a starting phase for some time where no product is leaving the continuous process. This is the time when first particles have reached the desired size. And then uh, we have a situation which can take days or even weeks where uh, we feed a liquid into the process and where we discharge pellets from the process. Micro pellets in the size I told you, truck load 90 to 100%. Uh, here, a few aspects to our technology, how we can separate uh, the good pellet size from the ones which are not yet in the feasible size and shape. We have our continuous process. We could have a so-called zigzag air sifter combined with the fluid bed unit. This would allow only the good sized particles, the well sized particles to leave the process. This is the best and the highest quality uh, approach for the pellets. Um, we could also uh, mount a so-called uh, screen mill cycle to our continuous fluid bed. Uh, that means um, the discharge of particles can include some larger ones. The larger ones, they are screened, they go through a mill and then uh, the milled material is recycled and only the good sized ones, the well sized ones, they are kept. All the other stuff is feedback and recycled. Here we have a look at uh, the complexity of uh, this process, the micropix and the procell. You see, it's yeah, it looks it looks simple, and it is. So pelletization, including the drying, is all done in one uh, in one fluid bed unit in our continuous process, providing the hydra loaded micro pellets. Here an example uh, where this technology uh, has been applied for commercial product. Uh, we have a taste mask clarithromycin product, a pediatric oral liquid had to be developed. Clarithromycin is an extremely bitter API. It's almost insoluble in water, but the dose is quite high. So what we had to do is to taste mask the drug uh, we provided micro pellets, which are smaller than 500 microgram, uh, micrometers in order to avoid gritty mouthfeel. We have a high drug load and we can prepare an oral liquid with these taste mask micro pellets for children. We could use a dry suspension to which water is added and which is then ready to use for two weeks or it could be filled into a X straw uh, in a single dose approach and then sipped by the children with a liquid. So taste masking sounds easy, but it is not. Yeah, to to uh, recall it again, uh, we must have a stability, no drug release for 14 days in the aqueous suspension, but when it's applied, uh, the drug should be released very fast. Here we see the solubility and the dose of the clarithromycin. And uh, I guess you can imagine what it means to make this insoluble material bioavailable 
in a in a quite high dose. So the factor in between the dose and the solubility, uh, just to play with this one, is more than one thousand six hundred. So we have to do something in order to make it bioavailable. And what we did here is we prepared micro pellets, not only containing uh, the clarithromycin, but also a solubilizer to improve the solubility and the bioavailability. We see here the crystalline uh, insoluble API, small crystals, and they are brought together in our micropix process with a solubilizer, with a surfactant. We have, in the end, uh, particles, micro pellets, uh, being a solid dispersion of the clarithromycin and our surfactant. And when this is put into water or when it comes into the stomach, we have a self-emulsifying effect and the insoluble clarithromycin is solubilized in the micelles of our surfactant. Very classical principle, uh, good applied here uh, in combination with a modern pharmaceutical technology. Here we see again such micelles. These are the surfactant mole uh, molecules. And inside the micelles, we have a lipophilic atmosphere. And in this lipophilic atmosphere, the water insoluble API is solubilized. Yeah, and this is done by, by itself in the sense of self emulsification. The total process here is to say it again, we have the clarithromycin micronized. We prepare a liquid out of it, including a binder. In this case, it's PVP and a surfactant. It's a poloxamer type. And uh, this liquid is transferred into the micro pellets, which in the end consists <clears throat> of 70% of the, of the active compound. They consist of the binder and the solubilizer. You saw them already. This is how they look in the end. Uh, these are the clarithromycin micro pellets, including the solubilizer coming out of the micropix technology. On this picture, we see uh, the commercial plant where they are manufactured. Um, just to give you an idea on the production capacity per hour, we have a throughput of about 10 kilograms for this uh, really high quality product. Uh, it means per day, we have about 240 and per year, depending on uh, how many days we would work, we would have a quantity of about 50 to 70 tons. It's a three shift mode process uh, it's a continuous process and thereby it's a three shift mode process. Well, these were uh, our technologies uh, for the core pellets. And as I already said, for the coating, it's much more simpler. Here we have one basic technology as our favorite, and this is the Worcester technology. Our matrix core pellets or our drug layered pellets, they are functionally coated in the Worcester technology. We look again at our Alkindi hydrocortisone immediate release pellets. Uh, I showed you already the drug layering step and in the same processing chamber with the same technology, Ideally, without interruption, we would apply the seal coat after the truck layering. And in the end, uh, for the hydrocortisone, the immediate release pellets, a taste masking is applied. We have these setup of taste mask pellets, and they are filled into capsules in different quantities. So we have one type of pellets, and we get a number of different dosage strengths when they are filled into capsules. Here we see uh, for 
the clarithromycin, the whole process. We ended up here with the micro pellet. And now we go for, uh, for the coating process for the application of the taste masking. First, a seal coat in order to cover the micro, micro pellets, the core pellets, and then a taste masking coating is applied in the end as a functional taste masking. So uh, for this uh, approach, we have the pelletization, the core technology, the micropix technology, and for the coating, we have the Worcester technology. This is the usual approach. Pelletization continuously for the micro pellets, high dosed in the micro picks, and then coating in the Worcester. Here we see again uh, this photograph inside the core pellets. We see a bright seal coat on top, uh, thin, and then the taste masking coating, which you see here as well, which is quite homogeneous and very dense. And that provides taste masking in our pediatric oral liquid. As I said, we want to have no dissolution in the suspension, but we want to have a fast drug release when it's applied to the patient. Here we can see the dissolution in neutral phosphate buffer very, very fast. We do not uh, achieve only such fast uh, drug release, but we can do it also very, very slow. Uh, just an example with metoprolol, it's a blood pressure uh, treatment uh, drug. Uh, here we have extended release pellets and uh, we can easily control the dissolution of metoprolol applying feasible coating materials on top of our, of our drug layered beads. I mentioned already the high potent drug products and uh, high potent are the ones uh, where the uh, overall, uh, the occupational exposure limit, uh, this is referring to work protection, to work safety is lower than 100 micrograms per one cubic meter of air. So that means the OEL levels Three, four, five, these are the critical ones. And here we have to do a lot. And our idea is why always make tablets? Why not prepare high potent pellets? Yeah, here we would have to go for core micro pellets, core pellets, as I showed you already. We could do it, do it by truck layering and then coat these particles. The process uh, I showed you for hydrocortisone could be the same for even more potent drugs. For even more potent drugs, we would need an isolator for the weighing of the pure compound. This is the most critical step. We would prepare a liquid. This is the only transfer, the only handling of the high potent drug compound, and then go into our Worcester process and prepare a high potent drug layer. And in order to seal this high potent drug layered beads, we could immediately apply a seal coating and then uh, the whole thing is not too risky anymore. Our fluid bed uh, machine is safe, even if we should have a hazard, an explosion, uh, such a modern unit would stand explosion pressures of up to 12 bars. So the machine is safe, the workers are safe, the machine is closed, and we have no contamination of the environment. For such high potent APIs, I would say uh, doing it in the Worcester, whenever possible, would be the simplest approach means in a first step drug layering and in the second uh, step directly uh, apply a seal coat and apply the coatings, ideally without opening the machine. 
We could also use these continuous pelletization technologies, but then we have to transfer the core pellets from the first process, from the continuous pelletization process into the coating unit. We have one product transfer. Can be handled, but uh, doing it all in one is even more elegant. Just to compare in the end, uh, the tableting and the pellet uh, manufacture, we map the processes. When we look at uh, tablet manufacture, we have the most critical step, which is dispensing of the API, but also in the next steps, granulation, drying, milling, blending, tableting, we have to face some API dust. Only when the tablets are uh, readily prepared and transferred into the coater, uh, the whole thing is uh, completely safe and without the risk of contamination. So for the tablets, we have six steps where we have to face API dust. If you look at film coated pellets, we have for sure also the dispensing of the API. We transfer it into a container with a solvent. We prepare an API liquid and then come drug layering, coating, sieving, and capsule filling with coated particles. And they are not as critical uh, as the ones uh, which uh, intermediate steps we know from, from the tableting. So when we prepare film coated pellets, we have only one uh, transfer step uh, for the during the dispensing of the API compared to six when we would prepare tablets. Looks simpler. To summarize all in one, in one picture, uh, we had the truck layering, the Worcester process, and the dry powder layering. We have for the matrix pellets, uh, two batch processes. I showed you the rotor and the CPS process. And for matrix pellets, in addition, we have continuous processes, which is extrusion spheronization and fluidized bed processes called micropix and Prozel. Uh, here, prilling could be another technology which will be put up uh, into the program. For the coating, uh, I told you that our absolute uh, favorite technology is the Worcester bottom spray fluid bed technology. We have alternatives available for sure, uh, but they are usually uh, applied only when it comes to avoid pat patent issues. Yeah, then we could use tangential spray or the rotor or CPS also for coating applications. But these are, uh, this is not the standard. Our standard is the Worcester bottom spray technology. So I hope that I could give you a kind of overview of what is possible in modern drug products uh, for our society, for the children, adults, older peoples, even for animals. We uh, are a service-based, service-oriented company. If you have any questions, if you have any challenges, please let us know, contact us, and we try to find a solution. We are active throughout the whole uh, life cycle uh, of a drug product from the development, from research and development to launch and commercial supplies, including analytical, um, analytical support. So just let us know and we try to give you what you want. Uh, as the Rolling Stone said many years back, you can't always get what you want but you get what you need. Thank you for listening. And uh, let's see what kind of questions Philip collected for us. Thanks a lot, um, Norbert. Um, excellent presentation as usual.
Um, I just tried to um, share the screen now here. So um, the session is open for questions. Um, of course, I directly have one in the meantime that people can start to think about some questions they might have, or you were so clear as usual that people don't have a lot of questions. So but, um, it was very interesting to see how, how many variations, how many possibilities we have within pellets and micro pellets. Now, the question is, if I look at um, the whole market, when we look at the whole market of drug products, we have about 70% of um, solid dosage forms. And within the solid dosage forms, I think the micro pellets and pellets is still a very tiny, tiny bit. Do you have any idea um, why this is the case? Yeah, good question. Uh, sometimes uh, we are quite a bit surprised uh, how people uh, structure their, uh, how people structure the development, how they uh, select the dosage forms. And uh, sometimes we are surprised that they are very often going along with the, with the standards and not having a look at the uh, more innovative uh, aspects uh, and possibilities. So if you have ideas, just let us know. So it, it seem, based on your answer, it seems to be like we are in a very risk averse industry and we like to do what we always did as long as it works, right? That's it. Okay, so um, Frederick Eggman has a question. Um, for the micropics, do you see it as an alternative to spray drying to make amorphous solid dispersions? Very nice question. Yeah, very good question, Frederick. Uh, good to not to hear you, but to hear your question. Uh, we um, made um, a thesis, a master thesis uh, in the last years, last few years, and uh, it was exactly uh, one of the topics of this master thesis to investigate whether we could prepare uh, pellets uh, as an amorphous solid dispersion uh, and matrix pellets uh, with micropics or with the process technology. This was one of the topics of this investigation and the result is it works. So uh, we can prepare amorphous solid dispersion based pellets uh, with exactly uh, the technologies I showed you, maybe not with the direct pelletization in the in the rotor, but we could do them uh, with drug layering, and we can prepare matrix uh, pellets uh, with the technologies Micropix and Procell. So um, the continuous process, uh, which is different from classical spray drying. Okay. And I assume that also instead of spray drying, spray granulation to um, achieve larger granules that can be potentially directly compressed would also be an alternative, right? Right. So <clears throat> uh, in this in this presentation, we focused more or less on the on the spherical particles. But uh, as Philip said, uh, we cannot only produce uh, spherical and small particles uh, with these technologies, but it's also uh, possible, and this is even simpler, uh, to prepare uh, agglomerates, which may be compressed to tablets. Okay. And you touched um, batch processes and continuous processes. Um, what is your take on? continuous processes, is this only viable for large quantities, large scale manufacturing, or does it already make sense for let's say medium or high value drug products? So it's not at all uh, uh, a process which is focusing on the, on the huge products. 
Um, what, what we think uh, is the reason to apply these technologies uh, is the resulting quality of the product. Uh, it's not our first uh, intention to go for a, a continuous process per se, but to use a continuous process as it is in a position to provide us with a particular quality of the drug product, which it is used for. And uh, this technology, uh, these micropix or ProCell continuous process can also be applied for, for smaller products. And uh, it's important to know, you don't even need a particular uh, separate uh, processing unit for these technologies. You might have a fluid bed unit uh, in your plant available and you just uh, switch from the Worcester configuration to Micropix configuration, just switching from one insert to the other. So uh, thanks a lot. So you see it more as more drug product options via the direct pelletization rather than high throughputs only, right? Absolutely. Okay, so it's all about the quality and uh, let's say the, the usability for the final drug product that we want to achieve. Now, um, yes. talking about this, um, you mentioned um, the different technologies and also that the, that the standard technology is the drug layering by the Worcester or drug layering on starter feeds. Where do you see, um, apart from API characteristics that we, that we um, need to take other technologies, where do you see the drug load um, maximum there that it still makes sense also from a production cost perspective later on? Yes. So uh, I would say a truck load of 60% uh, in a truck layered beat, this is absolutely realistic. Yeah, this is realistic and it makes sense. Uh, in our, in our uh, group, we developed a product uh, containing uh, a drug like Metoprolol. Uh, this one is uh, very water soluble. Uh, we do, uh, it's providing a sticky solution uh, of metoprolol succinate in water and to get a drug layer, we do not even need um, a binder uh, in the composition. Yeah, and with, su with such an approach, we can easily get a drug load of more than 75%, uh, around 75%, even without a batch split. Okay, so it's not only about the drug load per se, but the characteristics of the API, how much other excipients we need to stick it on, on, the, on, the, on the core. Now, coming to this a little bit more, um, a lot of people in the industry say that, ah, oh, pellet, I don't do pellet development because it's much more complicated and much more time consuming than if I do a standard tablet or something similar. How do you see this? <laughs> Is it really so much complicated or with the advantages that we have later on in the flexibility, does this compensate a little bit, the start perhaps? How do you see this? Yeah. So I would say, uh, if you talk about, is it complicated? I would say it's uh, not more complicated than uh, pro uh, preparing a tablet. Somebody who knows the process well, who is familiar with the processes, he would say it's simpler. He would okay. say it's simpler. Uh, you can uh, always read in, in, some, uh, in some papers, a uh, scale up with, uh, with the technology uh, is very, very difficult or even impossible. Yeah, this, is, this is not true. Uh, many, many companies all over the world use this technology. Still, they prepare more tablets. But when we look at, at our pellets, uh, I try to show you that we have the chance to prepare different kinds of drug products out of one type of pellets. And uh, 
considering then the time for development and the time for scale up and all these uh, aspects, I would say with the pellets, people would be even faster than uh, first develop a tablet and then start thinking about lifecycle management. You already gave the answer to my last questions I would like <laughs> to have on, asked you because I did a, a, a poll when to start developing pellets. And one of the questions was, do you only use it for life cycle management? Is it a basic for immediate and extended release? Or do you even use it for dose finding, right? And you say clearly the earlier you, you can start with a pellet formulation, the better it might be for the whole life cycle management in the end. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So I have not seen any further questions. And I think um, ah, there is, there is a remark uh, again from Frederick. A tablet rarely goes alone. You need to have granulations most of the time. So more complex than pellets. That's a good point, Frederick. That's what we say, Frederick. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So um, as we are heading on time, and the session is soon over. I would like to thank you very much again. I would like to thank the B Encapsulation Research Group and especially Dennis Ponsolet to uh, have organized the session. And I, of course, everybody involved as a participant. And I would not like to miss to um, announce the next events coming up. So it's the 24th Microencapsulation Industrial Convention in Rotterdam not online, it's live from May 2 to 5. And then an upcoming other webinar, uh, Dripping Technologies by Dennis Ponsler, NCAPS Process France on May 19th. And of course, you find all the information on the bioencapsulation.net website. Again, many thanks for attention, many thanks for organization and super talk by uh, Norbert and a nice chat which I enjoyed a lot. So have a nice afternoon and a good day. Bye-bye.